So I'll uh, talk something about security architectures in this particular session. So why we had to worry about the security architecture? Uh, the biggest problem is uh, security is a non-functional requirement, right? Uh, very rarely people come and say, um, I need this particular security features in my software. People describe about the functional requirements of the software. This is what the software is supposed to do. But they often miss the security part, right? Um, unless if somebody comes and say, OK, don't put any security in this particular system, you would have seen the Apple's letter to the customer about uh, FBI asking to remove security or put security holes into the iOS. In those cases, yes, security is given as a requirement. But generally, it's a non-functional requirement, and people uh, leave it out. And security is the first thing goes out of the window when your project get delayed. right? So that's one of the biggest problems. So you don't realize security unless you get into a trouble. People will not see security as an uh, uh, identifiable feature. So that's one of the reasons why you had to care much about the security. Again, security is very easy to make mistakes in security domain. Uh, if you miss something and make a hole, you will not identify un until you get into trouble. Uh, so you have to be very careful. Knowledge on security is very less. There are lots of people who, are, who feel secure by using obscurity. Basically, you say, I didn't put that particular stuff out, so nobody will know about that particular feature. So it's secure, which is called security by obscurity. Right? which is very bad in the security design. Again, uh, that is one of the problems. Again, too much of security will reduce your usability. So highly secured system is like that laptop. You just chain it with, uh, 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 put a chain and put a lock there. Nobody can use the system. So it's highly secure, but then your usability goes down. Right. Too much of security often result in lesser security because people uh, think that this is not a, uh, a usable system, or this is not a highly usable uh, uh, architecture. So they intentionally put backdoors in order to reduce their uh, burdens on the system. Right. So uh, too much of security often result in lesser security. Too less security is often result in less security. So you had to find the correct uh, balance of the security. So security patterns might help to reduce the risk because there are so many people uh, get into the same trouble. And uh, this is how they have reduced. So we'll, uh, that's the focus of this particular talk. Right? So what do you mean by security? I'm going to go through these topics. So uh, security is divided into these seven different areas, we will go one by one, right? So to start with authentication, what is authentication means, right? So basically, authentication says, unless you are someone known by the system, you will not be allowed to pass from that point onwards, right? So basically, authentication is proving who you are, right? Uh, so authentication has. Uh, two patterns. One is called the direct authentication, where the user has a direct trust relationship between the service which he is accessing. Right? So there are several protocols under the direct authentication, like basic auth, mutual auth, uh, OAuth, client credential, etc. Again, the idea is like the user has a direct relationship with the service provider. The second pattern in the authentication is brokered authentication. Basically, if you, um, you vouch for someone else, I trust somebody, and I don't trust other people, but the, the broker trusts other people and tell me, OK, I trust him. I trust him. You let him go, because I have a relationship with the, with the broker. right? Again, uh, 
So the way it works is the user tries to access the service provider, try to consume the service. However, the user doesn't have any direct relationship with the service provider, right? So he goes to the identity provider and authenticate to the identity provider. Identity provider gives you a token of some sort. And then you provide that token to the service provider. And there is an implicit or explicit trust uh, defined between the service provider versus the identity provider. Again, some of the protocols, SAML, OpenID, OAuth, etc. Again, the idea of the protocols is same. How they trust with each other, whether it's implicit, whether it's explicit, whether you had to uh, establish the trust beforehand or whether you can establish the trust on the fly, etc., will uh, vary based on the protocols. Again, so corollary of the brokered authentication is now you have a token uh, and you don't have direct trust with the service provider. You have trust with the identity provider and the service provider has trust with the identity provider. So very easy to implement something called single sign-on. So basically you log in only once, you get the tokens, then you go to various applications and you just give it. Only, uh, uh, only restriction there is the service providers where you are accessing uh, has to have a relationship with the identity provider. So how um, influential you are as an identity provider, there will be lots of service providers will trust you, right? That's the reason why people want to become influential, because multiple people trust, then you have more influence on the people. So similarly, when you have an identity provider which has more influence on multiple service providers, then it allows all the people to log in once and access any of these services. So that's a very uh, important pattern in the case of authentication. Second is the multi-factor authentication, second pattern. Again, uh, when you try to authenticate only once and access lots of uh, service providers, the, uh, the importance of authentication is uh, very important, right? Uh, basically, the, the biggest, weakest link in any of the security is the human being, right? People write the password, keep it on their purse, or keep it on their wallet, or just write it on their book. Then uh, if you let that kind of authentication, uh, that kind of users to be able to access any of the system, then that's a problem, right? So that's why the pattern of multi-factor authentication comes into play. So multi-factor means uh, you can use several factors, what you are, uh, what you know, what you are, and what you have, right? For example, what you know is something like a username password, some knowledge you have about the authentication. What you have is can be a token, like uh, what is shown in the uh, picture, or can be a mobile phone, etc. You own it. So you, by looking at some of the information on that particular device, you authenticate it. What you are is your um, biometric credential, either your retina scan or thumbprint, etc., uh, which is part of your system, part of your body. So that is what you have, what you are. So the multi-factor authentication tells combine more than one such factor together, right? So you combine either what you know and what you are, or combine what you know and what you have, or combine the other two, right? Or you can combine multiple stuff. Again, uh, WSO2 Identity Server supports all of these uh, patterns, all of these features, and you can configure multi-factor authentication, or you can configure single sign-on using the Identity Server. The next pattern is something called identity federation pattern. It's, uh, again, uh, part of the single sign-on. So in this particular example, let's say there are two domains. There are two security domains. One is called the foo, one is called the other one is called the bar. The foo applications, the web app here in this site, uh, web app here trusts this particular identity provider owned by the domain foo. The web apps over here trust the identity provider in domain bar. 
So let's say there is a user in domain foo who wants to access this particular application. So the way it works is it goes to the application. Application trusts the identity provider, so it redirects the user there. And then user has a credential in the identity server, so he logs in there. And then it creates a token, pass the token to the application. So now application trusts this identity provider. Hence, it trusts the token comes from the identity provider and let the users to access the application. Right? This is the normal single sign-on. So this particular identity federation pattern is when this particular user, who is a user of domain foo, tries to access an application in domain bar. Right? So this application trusts only this particular identity server, and this applications doesn't know anything about this user. This application doesn't know anything about this particular identity provider. Right? So the way it works is the user tries to access this particular application. The application, uh, since it trusts this identity provider, redirects user to this particular identity provider. And then this particular user tells to bar identity provider, saying, I am from full domain. So let me redirect back to the full identity provider. In order to do that, these two identity providers have to have a trust between those two. And uh, when the user got uh, redirected here, since he has already logged in previously, there will be a token created from this identity server. It will be sent to this particular identity provider. And then identity provider will validate that particular token. Since these two have trust relationship between, those, uh, between these two identity providers, it will accept that token, create a new token, and give it to the user so that user can access the application. Right? So this pattern is called the identity federation pattern and token exchange, because you get one token from your identity server, from your identity provider, give it to somebody else, and that guy change your token, exchange this identity server's token with some other identity server's token, and then provide it with you, right? So in this particular example, I have given only the SAML2 IDP. However, you can do with any identity protocols. So this person can log in here using OpenID, get a token from OpenID, access it, and get a SAML token, and then get it here. So any kind of tokens can be converted into any kind of token. This leads to something called identity bus. Right? Basically, you log in once using any authentication mechanism, and you want to access any of the applications using any authentication mechanism. So there has to be someone in middle converting one authentication mechanism into the other one, so basically exchanging your tokens. So that is done by the identity server, which acts as an identity bus, takes various identity protocol, authentication protocols, convert into various authentication protocols. Right? So this allows you to have multiple uh, authentication system with multiple protocols. The next uh, uh, pattern is something called trusted subsystem pattern. Again, in, this, in the distributed system, uh, when you have um, services available, when you access using some other system through some other system, it's overhead in order to authenticate again and again to the backend services. Let's say you are going to the water world in Avisavala, right? Uh, so uh, when you get the tickets, uh, they give you a wristband as well. If you go to any theme parks, they give a wristband. The intention of the wristband is whoever validating you after the entry point can, just as a glance, can know what other stuff you can access within that particular theme park. So it acts as something called trusted subsystem. The band is given by the issuing counter. Issuing counter will validate your credentials based on whether you have paid or whether you are allowed to access something then issues a very simplified token, trusted subsystem credentials, and all other backend systems will just trust that particular token and then let you to access it. So this is a very common pattern available 
in distributed systems in order to improve your effectiveness, uh, improve the efficiency of the system. Again, uh, another pattern is the multiple user stores. Um, so often you have some applications which will be accessed by your employees and which will be accessed by your customers, right? And often uh, most of the organization don't want to put those two user base into a single user store. So uh, the identity server provides a support to have multiple identity stores still authenticate into a single application. So when the user tries to access any application, they give the credentials, then identity server will uh, validate that particular credential comes from which user store, and then evaluate or authenticate the user based on that particular user store. So these are the authentication protocols. As part of the authentication or the identity, you have something called provisioning as well. So basically, when you have multiple systems, often in order to authenticate, those, uh, authenticate to those systems, you have to have accounts on those systems, right? So when the user comes, you might have to create accounts on various places. So the provisioning framework provides you to create users uh, only once in the identity server, and it will in turn create users in various other systems. Right? So this is another pattern which is often useful for authentication. So authorization. The next part of the security is the authorization. Um, so authorization is what you can do in this particular system, right? You uh, are allowed to do only some set of functionality, and if you try to access some other functionality, you are not allowed to uh, do it, right? So authorization or the access control is done using something called principle of least privileges. You give minimum amount of privilege for a user where the user can perform his functionality and not more than that, right? So there are two ways you can provide it by either using role-based access control. Basically, you, when the user logs in, he will be uh, given a set of roles. And then uh, in the applications, you say this particular role can access these functionalities, right? So that is the role-based access control. The other one is called the attribute-based access control. Uh, basically, you look at some of the attributes of the user and then see whether the user can be allowed to uh, do something. Let's take this particular example, which is an attribute-based access control. This user wants to go to a bar and buy beer, right? Uh, so in US, uh, at least, uh, I don't know about here, um, uh, they check your credential. You, they check your date of birth before issuing beers, right? So uh, the user gets something called um, some other token. Let's say in this particular case, uh, he's getting a driving license. Again, the purpose of getting driving license is not to go for the bar, right? It's a general purpose token issued for something else. However, this particular user gives the driving license to the bar, and they extract the date of birth from the token the driving license, which is attribute coming on a token. And these two has implicit trust between them. Basically, they say whatever the driving license, which is official, is valid. So people, uh, the person would have, wouldn't have made any fraud there. So they will let you to access the service, right? So that is the attribute-based access control. Often, the attribute-based access control will become very complex, so you often extract it out, all that logic, out of your applications, put it on a centralized place with some policies, which is called the policy-based access control. So, so this policy-based access control is achieved using a policy called ZACML, Extensible uh, Access Control Markup Language. Uh, so basically, the ZACML provides um, uh, separate entities, something called P star P, right? So first one is the policy enforcement point, or PEP. The other one is called the policy decision point. Uh, there is something called policy information point, and there is something called policy administration point, right? 
So when the application, initially the admin creates the policy using the policy administration point, which is uh, our identity server, and the policies will be created here. So by the way, the ZACML policy is an XML-based policy language, which can define very fine-grained authorizations. Um, so when the user tries to access the application, the policy enforcement point will extract some information from the user, possibly his username, possibly his other tokens, other uh, claims, or like date of birth or something from the token he is having. Then send it to the policy decision point, where the decision is made whether the user can access the service or not. So the policy decision point will load all the policies available and then might have to extract some additional information by using policy information point. Let's say you give the username only. However, in order to validate the particular policy, you want to identify uh, the, the nationality of the user, right? Often the application will not know. The policy is written with uh, different, uh, different access control for different nationality, right? So the policy information point has to extract that information uh, in order to evaluate the policy. That's a uh, functionality of the policy information point. And then after evaluating the policy, the policy decision point will re re reply back saying whether it's an allow or deny or non-deterministic, et cetera, and then let the application to make the decision, right? So this is an authorization, very fine-grained authorization. The next is the encryption. So basically, encryption or confidentiality is achieved using the encryption, right? Uh, so there are two kinds of uh, confidentiality you can achieve, either the transport level or at the message level. So transport level is uh, coming from mainly from HTTPS or TLS, et cetera, uh, where the entire message is encrypted. And uh, the, uh, the, the message will be passed as a blank message from here, will be encrypted by the transport mechanism, and will get decrypted on the other side and give it to the application. The message level is the application or the client itself encrypts some part of the message. So it doesn't need to be the entire message is encrypted, but only some part will get encrypted, and then will be given to the service and uh, the service will be able to decrypt. So the uh, choice, the architectural choice of what you want to do here is you might end up with multiple hops in the case of uh, uh, distributed system, right? So hop to hop, uh, when there are uh, transport level encryption, the encryption happens at each and every hops. Right? So that will be uh, like either performance critical or possibly the message might get leaked to uh, information leak uh, in the case of uh, some other intruders in the middle, et cetera. But in the case of message encryption or message level encryption, the message is encrypted at the client level, and when it passed to the final destination, only it will get decrypted. So it might give you much more security uh, than the transport level. Again, there are, from the protocol-wise, there are two kinds of encryptions, either symmetric encryption or asymmetric encryption. Uh, basically, symmetric means you have the encryptor and the decryptor uses the same key to encrypt and decrypt. In the case of asymmetric, uh, you use uh, X509 tokens, so basically you have a, a public key where you use that to encrypt, and there is a private key where only the decryptor has the private key, and he will be able to use it to decrypt the message. Again, the design choice is symmetric, or the asymmetric encryption is 10 times slower than the symmetric encryption, right? That means performance-wise, asymmetric encryption is much more uh, uh, performance, uh, resource-consuming. So generally, people select the symmetric encryption for the normal big message encryptions. However, you can use the asymmetric encryption to share a key, share a session key between two entities. So basically, you create a session key, uh, use the asymmetric encryption to encrypt the key, send it to the receiver. Receiver decrypts and establish a session key or a key between those two, and then uh, use the asymmetric encryption for those two uh, conversations. 
Uh, one uh, derivation of that is something called session key-based encryption, where after you establish the session key between those two, you derive some other key, some other uh, uh, message level keys for each and every message. So people who use WS security would know uh, there are something called secure conversation, which is established using uh, this particular technology. We are, you establish a session key and then derive some other keys per each and every message communication so that if somebody uh, decrypts one message, still they will not be able to decrypt the other messages, etc. Right? So again, in the SOAP or XML case, you have XML encryption. In the case of JSON, you have JSON encryption uh, standards, so you can use them for the confidentiality. So the digital signature is, again, uh, uh, to uh, know whether the message got modified when it was transferred from one place to the other, right? Uh, so whoever gave university recommendation would have known. You put the recommendation in the envelope. You sign it in the envelope so that if somebody breaks it, you will identify that, OK, somebody have tampered with your message, right? Something like that. So that is an uh, integrity mechanism uh, for physical world. In the case of digital world, uh, you have something called digital signature. Again, uh, you have two levels, transport level and the message level. Uh, transport level is given by HTTPS and TLS. Uh, message level uh, can be uh, at the uh, individual message or part of the message level. Again, uh, symmetric and asymmetric, similar to encryption, you also have the symmetric and asymmetric. Either same key is used for the signatures, then it is called symmetric. If you are signing using your private key, and the, uh, the receiver can validate your signature using your public key, that is called a symmetric uh, signature. Right? Again, session-based, uh, key-based signature is similar to what I explained before. So the next part is the non-repudiation. Basically, how do you know, OK, I have done something. After some time, I, uh, I, I say, I didn't do that. How can you prove that I have done the stuff, right? If you have kids, you know uh, you need a, a non-repudiation protocol for them. Basically, whatever they do, they didn't do, actually. So uh, how the non-repudiation is achieved at the um, digital level is by using the digital signature again as asymmetric signature. So in the case of asymmetric signature, you sign the message using your private key. And only you have the private key. And anybody can validate the signature using the public key of yours, which is public knowledge. However, since you signed it, and only you have the message, you are the one initiated the message. So in any court case or anything, you can uh, make sure, or the receiver can make sure that he can prove that the message was sent by you because it was signed by you, because you have your private key, and nobody else has the private key. So that is the basis for non-repudiation. Then auditing is the next part, right? Like you would have known the story of the Trojan horse. You might have a well-guarded fort or castle, but some human decides, OK, that's a nice-looking uh, um, wooden horse, so let it bring it inside, right? So people make mistakes, and intentionally or unintentionally, and you have to find uh, such cases. So auditing is done in a way that you collect all the audit logs or all the logs and then analyze for any uh, problems, any anomalies or any fraud, etc. So again, uh, uh, identity server supports audit logs, etc. And we have a, uh, our analytics frameworks support any anomaly detection or fraud detection. We have a fraud detection toolkit as well. Uh, where you can run and find any anomaly or fraud uh, within the system. The next level is the availability. Um, so availability is uh, to make sure that the system is available for uh, valid users, and they will be able to access, the valid users should be able to access the system without any downtime, right? So generally, it's done at the network level. Uh, basically, you identify if there are any available, uh, availability issues. Uh, you try to identify it at the gateway level, if there are any attacks happening uh, 
um, something called denial of service attacks, etc., and then uh, terminate the connections for such kind of denial of service at the gateway level. Again, uh, throttling can also be used to fight for this denial of service. You might have a valid user, however, he's bombarding uh, the system, right? So you identify how much of allowed usage is uh, given for that particular user, and after some time, you can stop the user. It can be based on the user credentials, it can be based on the OAuth tokens, or it can be based on IP address, et cetera. Again, uh, Frank talked about the heartbeat, watchdog, hot pooling, et cetera. So basically, you put uh, n number of replicas and then uh, proactively check whether the replicas are up and uh, running by using heartbeat. And if it is not up and running or if uh, you detect something is going to go wrong, you shut it down and start a new instance, new replica, and thereby you can provide high availability. So those are the seven security uh, uh, main uh, areas. I just want to briefly discuss about the deployment patterns as well. So this is uh, common deployment patterns where the customers are uh, uh, deploying. You divide your infrastructure into three zones. One is called the red zones, the other one is called the yellow zones, and the other one is called the green zone. So red zone is the internet where you run the client applications, and there is a firewall between red and yellow. And in the yellow, you do the API uh, gateway or integrations, etc. Basically, you accept the message and do uh, pre-processing. And in the green zone is highly trusted zone, uh, so you run your database services, etc. In most of the cases, you can go from one zone to the other. You can't cross another zone. For example, red zone to green zone, communications are not allowed. So these are the connection establishments. Uh, uh, the, the arrow shows the connection establishment. So you are allowed to go only this way. So this is, again, you can use when you do the deployment. However, there is a more restricted version. If you are too paranoid, there are uh, cases where you will allow only communication going from green to yellow and never allow communication coming from yellow to green, right? So how do you achieve that? You put a message broker in the yellow zone, and whatever the message comes from here, you put it on a message queue or somewhere, and then uh, whenever uh, the green zone wants to take or periodically pull to from here to there, take the message, process it, put it again to the yellow zone, and then it will send it back, right? So this is more restricted and more uh, 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 secure environments. But generally, uh, it's very rare people ask for this. We have seen only one or two customers asking for it. But uh, the other pattern is all common, right? So uh, that's end for today. So I just want to conclude it with the statement um, so more secure, if you make too much secure, it will actually bring your security down because people will try to bypass your security layer. Less secure means people will not bother and you will not know it until somebody broke into your system. So try to find the maximum level or uh, optimal level uh, where you have the security and the usability. Excellent.